listening to Tea with Tolkien, a podcast for the Hobbit at heart. Join us as we chat about the works and faith of J.R.R. Tolkien and strive to carry a little piece of Middle-earth into our own daily lives. This is number four in a seven-part book club series on The Lord of the Rings. These episodes will be released on the first of each month from now through March to accompany our book club as we are reading The Lord of the Rings. If you would like to join our book club, you can visit teawithtolkien.com slash book dash club. I will be providing all of the notes from this episode to our patrons, so if you feel like you would like to support Tea with Tolkien and that you would benefit from having all of these notes written down, please consider joining us. You can learn all about our Patreon tiers and benefits at patreon.com slash teawithtolkien. Now on to book four. I think this has been my favorite book so far. I really... I'm not so much into all of the battles and like strategy kind of stuff. I'm really into when Tolkien gets into the personal story and we can see the characters developing very closely. Um, I like to be able to see all of the humanity within the characters. Um, And I feel like when Tolkien kind of zooms out into the big picture, like he does a lot in the last book, that's not my favorite. So I'm super excited for book four. Chapter one, The Taming of Smeagol. Frodo and Sam are scrambling across desolate rocky terrain as they struggle in the general direction of Mordor, although it doesn't really feel like they're getting any closer. They're feeling lost and discouraged, and they often find themselves going in circles, so it's not going well at all. They have long sensed that Gollum is following them, and they finally see him crawling towards them, and instead of attacking or trying to hide, they approach him and basically end up taking him as their guide. They make a deal with him and he makes a promise to the precious, which is going to hold them accountable. It's in this chapter that we finally encounter Gollum face to face, which is so exciting because up until this point, we've been hearing a little bits about him and we've heard everything in book one that Gandalf has to say about him, but now we're going to meet him and we're going to see his humanity and his personality and everything that he's up to. He's, he's a miserable and broken creature. His thoughts are constantly fixed on what he calls the precious, which is the ring, and he both loves it and hates it, just like he loves and hates himself. Like, he's an extremely tormented soul. He sees the hobbits as thieves and spies. He's described as miserable, lonely, a poor wretch, full of wickedness and mischief. And things that are meant to be good, such as the elven rope, actually cause him harm. Now that Frodo sees him, he does understand that While Gollum probably does deserve death, he also has grown to pity him, and they kind of develop a sort of understanding. And I think Frodo is very empathetic to him because as Frodo is carrying the ring, he understands that he and Gollum are bound by the ring. And this is something that Sam can't understand. And so Sam is a lot less kind to Gollum than Frodo is. Frodo has this great pity for Gollum because it was the ring that has driven Smeagol to become the creature known as Gollum. It's not by any power of his own that he's become so wretched, although he wasn't like the best guy to begin with, but it's by the power of the ring, which is the manifestation of all evil in this story, and it's a burden that Frodo is now struggling to bear. So Frodo sees himself in Gollum in a way. Smeagol's slow fade into becoming the creature Gollum was brought about by the will of the ring. Smeagol was this young and naive little guy when he first laid eyes on the ring, and for nearly 500 years, it slowly poisoned his heart and mind. Um, 500 years is just like such an incredibly long time, and I think it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. Like you can see someone after 10 years of, of being addicted to something or having some kind of horrible destructive habit, but can you imagine 500 years? So it's just a very sad story. But the power of the ring doesn't work quickly. It has slowly eroded him, like water eroding a rock until great canyons are formed. This chapter parallels the opening chapters of book three, where Frodo is lamenting um, how all of his choices have gone wrong. And it reminds me of when Aragorn is kind of doing the same thing. He's struggling with his own self-doubt and trying to figure out what the next step is, because Through the Fellowship of the Ring, they kind of knew exactly where they were going, but once they got to the falls and once the Fellowship was broken, um, no one was really expecting that, and so it's been a very difficult journey from there forward for them to figure out what the right choice is. Chapter 2, The Passage of the Marshes 
The heart of Smeagol really shines through this chapter as he is earnestly guiding Frodo and Sam through the dead marshes. He appears to be like actually genuinely concerned about their well-being, especially when Frodo lags behind and is enchanted by the lights of the marshes. Even as he struggles internally against his desire for the ring, he's plotting and arguing with himself. There's a there's definitely a part of his heart that still desires to be good, and we see that a lot in this chapter. Um, even though he's still not quite trustworthy, they are developing this kind of unlikely sort of friendship or companionship, however strained. The hobbits care for Smeagol, and he cares for them, and they depend on each other in their own ways. The hobbits even go so far as to offer to share their food with Smeagol, and even though that doesn't work out. And then Smeagol really does work pretty hard to guide them through these dangerous marshes. This is further illustrated um, in the chapter as all three of the companions rest peacefully at the same time in this chapter, and that's like a really, a really nice kind of image, even though it definitely freaked Sam out to begin with. It kind of seems like even though danger is looming over them, they're coming to realize that Gollum doesn't really pose much of a threat for them at the time being. Maybe he will later, but right now they seem to have developed a kind of uneasy trust and, and a relationship that benefits each other as they're going. After this realization, the chapter does kind of become a bit more relaxed in tone, if that's a good way of describing it. While their quest is weighing a lot more heavily on Frodo's heart, the, the further he goes and the closer he gets to Mordor, he is comforted, at least in a small way, by the guidance of Smeagol and the dutiful care of Samwise. Chapter 3. The Black Gate is Closed. Gollum leads Frodo and Sam to the Black Gate, where they find it closed and impassable, as the chapter's title might suggest. There, Gollum offers them a new plan, which is quote, darker, more difficult to find, more secret. Um, at that point, they're kind of like, why didn't you tell us about this plan before? And he's like, well, you didn't ask. And okay, that makes sense. And so Frodo is struggling to discern his course. And this chapter or this passage reminds me a lot of Christ's agony in the garden. Frodo says, I am commanded to go to the land of Mordor and therefore I shall go. If there is only one way, then I must take it. What comes after must come. And it reminds me of this verse from uh, the gospel according to Mark chapter 14. Yet not what I will, but what you will. So Frodo has really committed fully and resigned himself to the fate. Um, and his fate is bound up with the ring. He agonizes over what to do because he's kind of at a stopping point And he doesn't know, like, if the gate is closed, what do you do? He wishes desperately for the counsel of Gandalf until he at last decides to follow Gollum once more on this new path that Gollum has suggested. As they change course, Frodo warns Gollum of the gravity of his oath that he had made to the precious. Despite all weakness and fear, Frodo has committed himself wholeheartedly to his task. He has accepted that it will almost certainly claim his life and yet he doesn't turn back. He has this really great respect for his role as ring bearer and he holds firm to the command that was given to him. I think now would be a good time just to take a moment to talk about Lembus because it's been mentioned a couple times in the previous books and it's going to be mentioned more as we keep reading, but I thought this would be a good spot to just like pause and discuss Lembus specifically. We're first introduced to Lembus in the Fellowship of the Ring when the Fellowship is leaving Lothlorien. As they're preparing to set off, Galadriel presents him with several gifts, um, both for each individual and for the company as a whole, and one of these gifts is a whole bunch of Lembus. Now, Lembus was actually first made by Yavanna, one of the queens of the Valar, the same one that made the Ents, and this recipe was eventually passed down to Galadriel. It's actually made out of a special grain that is or was grown in Amman, and it's also an elvish custom, apparently, that only women are the ones who bake it, so um, that's a huge win for women, in my opinion. Now, if you'll remember your Silmarillion lore, Melian gives a store of Lembus to Beleg Strongbow when he leaves to go find Turin. But other than that, Lembus isn't really mentioned much before the Lord of the Rings. It's also extremely rare that Lembus would be given to any non-elves. In fact, I haven't really read of any instances of it happening before. Um, if I'm wrong, please let me know, because obviously I would like to know. But um, in the little bit of research I did, I didn't really see anywhere that non-elven folk are given Lembus. So this is a huge, huge gift. Um, I think Galadriel really understands how much Frodo is going to need it on his journey because she understands where he's going. In the Fellowship of the Ring, the elves explain basically what Lembus is, how to care for it, and so on. Tolkien writes, Eat a little at a time, and only at need, for these things are given to serve you when all else fails. 
The cakes will keep sweet for many, many days if they are unbroken and left in their leaf wrappings, as we have brought them. One will keep a traveler on his feet for a day of long labor, even if he be one of the tall men of Minas Tirith. Lembus also has sort of a holy property to it, as does most things that come from the elves. Um, And this is illustrated quite well when Gollum is unable to eat it. He's repulsed by it, and um, when he tries a little crumb, he starts choking. A creature so evil as Gollum is actually harmed by something so holy as this bread from the elves. If you're really interested in the topic of Lembus, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it in this book club episode because I actually did an entire podcast on it back in episode 9. So please check that out if you're interested in a deeper discussion of Lembus. I will link to it in the show note. Chapter 4 of Herbs and Stewed Rabbit The hobbits follow Smeagol through Athelion as their road begins to grow more pleasant. Finally, we have a little break from all of the desolation. Their hearts rise with the familiar landscape of trees and grass, and there's even herbs growing all over the place. Although scars and wounds of war can still be seen, it's just a much better environment than they had been before. They all become pretty hungry, and they're feeling a little bit more safe for the present, so they take a break, and Sam is able to stew a few rabbits that Smeagol has caught for them. After this, um, Smeagol is horrified that Sam would be cooking the rabbits in such a way. He recommends just, you know, crunching right into them, which disgusts Sam. This is also the wonderful chapter in which we get the legendary potatoes line. Um, So anyways, Smeagol does not want to eat the stew that Sam makes, so he leaves in search of his own food. And then the hobbit's cooking fire is discovered by... Captain Faramir and his scouts. They are surrounded and questioned, and their answers are surprising to Faramir. After this, there is a short battle that breaks out, and the hobbits are then taken into Faramir's company. We are reminded in this chapter just how far from home Frodo and Sam have really come. As the surrounding landscape becomes more familiar, they are made more aware of their desire for the comforts of home, specifically a nice meal. Tolkien writes, a supper or a breakfast by the fire in the old kitchen at Bagshot Row was what he really wanted. Despite being so far from home, though, Sam has still carried a little bit of hope in the form of his cooking tools and a precious box of salt. Through Sam, we are taught an unlikely lesson about home. Though he greatly desires home, he doesn't abandon his quest for the sake of his own comfort. He and Frodo have embraced their quest wholeheartedly, choosing to forego the comforts of a pint of ale beside the fire or time smoking with friends for the sake of saving all of Middle-earth. Rather than turning aside from their quest in favor of the comforts at home, they continually choose to walk farther and farther from them. Every step they take brings them farther from everything they know and love. And this is really at the heart of The Lord of the Rings and all of the great stories, I would argue, being willing to set aside something good in order to save it. This is what Frodo and Sam are doing. Yet even here in this chapter, Tolkien shows us that there can still be moments of consolation along the road. So despite having accepted such a horrible, dark, and dangerous quest, they're able to relax for just a little bit and enjoy a nice rabbit stew. Comfort in itself is not an obstacle to virtue, but a disordered attachment to it is. And while hobbits are known for their quaint and comfortable lives, they've also got a pretty amazing ability to go without these comforts when necessary, which is something that I love about them. Chapter 5, The Window on the West. Frodo and Sam are questioned once again by Faramir, who remains skeptical of their answers. Faramir reveals that Boromir has died, and this is pretty shocking and upsetting to Frodo, and also that he is Boromir's brother. However, as they continue to speak with him, they grow in trust of one another and they kind of begin to realize that Faramir is not a bad guy. However, Frodo is careful not to reveal too much of his quest and he keeps in mind the way that Boromir attempted to to take the ring from him. However, unfortunately, Sam accidentally reveals that Isildur's bane is the one ring and then Faramir pretty quickly puts all the pieces together. Fortunately for them, Frodo tells Faramir that he would not take the ring even if it lay by the highway, not were Minas Tirith failing in ruin and I alone could save her, so using the weapon of the Dark Lord for her good and my glory. No, I do not wish for such triumphs, Frodo, son of Drogo. Faramir's character is arguably the most saintly of all the men in Middle-earth. He stands in stark contrast to Boromir, who is proud and eager. Faramir does not seek glory, rather he carefully pursues virtue and wisdom. In him, the hobbits find nothing to fear, and instead they are surprised to find a great aid and counsel. 
Now, I want to pull out two quotes from Faramir for discussion, and I think these would be fun to talk about in the Discord. The first one is, I would not snare even an orc with a falsehood. And the second is, war must be while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. These are two really good quotes that um, illustrate Faramir's character, and I think they're also really good to reflect on um, in our own lives. Faramir is faced with the same temptation of his brother, an opportunity to take the ring by force, and yet he is not tempted at all. By his speech and action, he shows that his heart is truly pure. Where Boromir is haughty and proud and desires glory, Faramir is cautious, humble, and he desires peace. Not to dunk on Boromir, but Faramir is just objectively better, and I'm sorry. Boromir is also great too. I think he gets a bad reputation because of what he did in the end of the Fellowship of the Ring, but um, I think that many of us might find ourselves equally as tempted as Boromir. Uh, We all like to think that we are Faramir, but I don't think I don't know. I just, I don't, I think we are, we all struggle with temptation, just like Boromir. So I don't think we should be mean to Boromir. However, um, one good discussion point for our Discord community would be why have Faramir and Boromir, who are two brothers raised in the same environment, grown to be so different? Because I think if you look back through the book, um, through some other things Tolkien has written, you can see a couple of hints as to why um, or factors that may have helped shape them as they grew. I also wanted to read two quotes from Tolkien's letters about Faramir because I think they're really interesting. Tolkien writes in letter 66, A new character has come on the scene. I am sure I did not invent him. I did not even want him, though I like him. But there he came walking into the woods of Thilion, Faramir, the brother of Boromir, and he is holding up the catastrophe by a lot of stuff about the history of Gondor and Rohan. If he goes on much more, a lot of him will have to be removed to the appendices where already some fascinating material on the Hobbit tobacco industry and the languages of the West have gone. Tolkien also writes in one of his letters, I am not Gandalf, being a transcendent sub-creator in this little world. As far as any characters like me, it is Faramir, except that I lack what all my characters possess. Let the psychoanalysts note, courage. So Tolkien is being a bit modest, I think, but I also think it's really interesting how he sees himself in Faramir, one of the best characters. Chapter 6. The Forbidden Pool Frodo is awoken in the night and brought to the Forbidden Pool, where Faramir's men have found Gollum searching for fish. Faramir explains that the law requires his death for trespassing, but Frodo asks them to spare him. Although he wishes he could be rid of Gollum, he recognizes that he is unfortunately bound to him. They grant him permission to go down to the pool, where he struggles to convince Gollum to come with him. Um, Eventually, Frodo resorts to threatening Gollum by the precious and that finally gets him. However, he soon realizes that Frodo has tricked him, and he is captured by Faramir's men. Faramir places Gollum under the protection of Frodo, threatening him with death if he is ever seen in these lands without Frodo. He questions them regarding their plan, becoming distraught to hear that they plan to use the path of Kirith Ungol. Frodo protests that this is the only way, um, however, he's grateful for Faramir's counsel. Although he is suspicious of Gollum, Faramir allows him to continue as the Hobbit's guide as they prepare to part ways. Despite wishing he could be rid of Gollum, Frodo knows that he is bound to him and he can't in good conscience allow him to be killed by Faramir's men. He understands how lost he and Sam would have been in the marshes without his guidance, and he also feels very indebted to him, and he also has this kind of bond with him because of the precious. Frodo chooses to honor his agreement to Gollum, attempting to regain his trust after he's taken by Farmer's men, um, although I do think a lot of damage was done in this chapter. Frodo really could have quickly ordered Farmer to end Gollum's life for his convenience, and he might have been better off, I don't know, but he kept the wisdom of Gandalf in his heart and he chose to recognize and he chose to respect his own conscience. In this chapter, we are reminded of the way that we all belong to each other. Chapter 7, Journey to the Crossroads Frodo and Sam awaken, eat breakfast, and prepare to part ways with the company of Faramir. Their packs are filled with food, and they are each gifted a walking stick for their journey. Faramir's scouts bring news that the surrounding lands are strangely empty, and Faramir urges the hobbits to make haste. Filled with gratitude and a lot of good counsel, Frodo remarks to Faramir, 
It was said to me by Elron Halfelvin that I should find friendship upon the way, secret and unlooked for. Certainly I looked for no such friendship as you have shown. To have found it turns evil to great good. At their departure, Faramir bids them, Go with the good will of all men. They journey for days through the deepening silence and sickening darkness. Everything is just uneasy. Gollum grows ever more restless, urging them forward. We're not in decent places. Time's running short, yes, running fast. No time to lose, we must go, he says. At last they draw near to the crossroads, where Frodo is filled with dread. However, despite all of their fear, the hobbits experience a few glimmers of hope amidst the darkness. As the setting sun reveals to them a head of carven stone toppled from a statue of a king. Upon its head, Tolkien writes, a trailing plant with flowers like small white stars had bound itself across the brows as if in reverence for the fallen king. To which Frodo says, The king has got a crown again. They cannot conquer forever. This chapter brings a lot of glimmers of unexpected hope. Unlooked for friendship, a replenished food supply, the aid of these walking sticks, and the gentle reminder that evil cannot conquer forever in the floral crown of the fallen king. This world may often feel sickening and dark, like the roads Frodo and Sam must walk, but the reality is that there is still so much goodness, and it is only up to us to notice it. So I love the way that Tolkien ends this chapter with a note of hope, because in the next couple chapters, uh, things are going to get quite bad. Chapter 8, The Stairs of Kirith Ungol. Gollum leads them quickly towards the stairs of Kirith Ungol. At this point, the hobbits are extremely worn down by their quest, and Tolkien writes that they are no longer able to care greatly about their peril. They are near the base of the stair, and at this point, they see something horrifying. They see Minas Morgul, the city of the Ringwraiths. A terrible great army is marching from the gates, and while Frodo has no desire to put on the ring, he finds his hand moving against his will towards the chain on his neck. After forcing his hand away and instead gripping desperately to the file of Galadriel, he is relieved for the moment of all thought of the ring. He's deadly tired at this point, but Gollum is urging them to hurry, so they begin to climb these narrow stairs. After a very long time, they come to a place of rest, where Tolkien writes, The hobbits took what they expected would be their last meal before they went down into the nameless land, maybe the last meal they would ever eat together, which just gives me chills, it's so sad. Honestly, this is when the story just gets like, you're just pummeled with the story, is how I feel as a reader. Frodo and Sam begin to reflect on their journey, and they're thinking of all the great stories, especially of Baron and Luthien, wondering if they will ever be put into such tales which is, this is an incredible scene. Tolkien writes, Why, to think of it, we're in the same tale still. It's going on. Don't the great tales never end? No, they never end as tales, said Frodo. But the people in them come, and go on when their part's ended. Our part will end later, or sooner. This is another one of those places where having read the Silmarillion before the Lord of the Rings um, adds so much depth and richness to the story, because if you've read the story of Baron and Luthien, you can see how all of these elements of the story have carried through, and the star glass from Galadriel is connected all the way back to the story of Baron and Luthien, and even farther. And the way that everything is connected and everything is related, it brings the hobbits a lot of hope. We might look at history and feel as though its stories are far off and disconnected from our own, but this chapter reminds us that we really are a part of something that's much greater than our own selves. There's this temptation to feel unimportant or small in this understanding, but instead I would propose that it should fill us with a great sense of belonging and purpose and responsibility, just like these hobbits. You have been born into the story of the world in the exact place and time you were meant to be. You were given a role to play by the divine creator himself, and it is up to you to carry your quest to completion. This chapter also offers us a final glimpse into the heart of Smeagol as we catch perhaps the last glimmers of the old gray humanity in his eyes. So he goes off for a while, and he returns to the hobbits as they're sleeping, and he's, he appears to struggle internally with himself, and he slowly reaches out to gently wake Frodo. Tolkien writes, For a fleeting moment, could one of the sleepers have seen him? They would have thought they beheld an old weary hobbit, shrunken by the years that had carried him far beyond his time beyond friends and kin, and the fields and streams of his youth, an old, starved, pitiable thing. 
Now, although the hobbits aren't awake to witness it, Tolkien's description of the hurt that Smeagol has suffered from the ring is just heartbreaking. Frodo, Sam, and Smeagol all play critical and yet vastly different parts in the story of the ring. We are reminded in this last glimpse of Smeagol's humanity that even Smeagol was created for goodness, and even though the power of the ring has caused him to wander so far from his original path, there is still good in his heart, and Providence may still give him the grace to help heal the world. So, that passage just really gets me. Um, I think it's really important. It's something that my first couple of times I read The Lord of the Rings, I just went right past it, but if you really pull it out and reflect on it, it's very moving. Chapter 9, She Loves Lair. Gollum leads the hobbits toward a massive tunnel, which is She Loves Lair, although they don't know that yet, obviously. Once inside, they are overwhelmed by the utter darkness and the stench of filth. As they walk blindly through the tunnel, they soon realize that Gollum has left them again, but something about this feels different. He's really gone this time, I fancy, muttered Sam. I guess this is just exactly where he meant to bring us. Soon they hear a gurgling, bubbling noise and a long, venomous hiss, which has got to be the absolute scariest thing to hear when you are in the dark tunnel. And at this, they realize Gollum has led them into a trap. Surrounded by overwhelming darkness, Frodo and Sam are saved only by the light, realizing now that light indeed alone can help them. Sam reminds Frodo of the star glass, the phial of the Lady of Galadriel, a light when all other lights go out, she had called it. Frodo cries, Aya, Yarendil, Elenion, Ankalima, which means, Hail, Yarendil, brightest of stars in Quenya. Realizing they can't run from Shelob, Frodo holds fast to the star glass, drawing his sword and advancing towards Shelob. Tolkien writes, Then holding the star aloft and the bright sword advanced, Frodo, hobbit of the Shire, walked steadily down to meet the eyes. When Frodo comes closer to her, the eyes, he can, because he can only see her eyes at this point, he sees them draw back. And Tolkien writes, no brightness, no brightness so deadly had ever afflicted them before. From sun and moon and star, they had been safe underground. But now a star had descended into the very earth. And as I was reading it and preparing for this book club, like that line just stuck with me and it just gives me chills. It's so, so good. Like how is Tolkien so good? A star had descended into the very earth. Just like, just think about that. That's crazy. Um, something about this line feels very reminiscent of the incarnation and then it feels perfect for Advent. I actually was so inspired by this that I created a, a little art piece design. Um, and I have that as a free printable up on my website and I will link to it. If anyone would like to see it and download it and print it, I was just in awe of this line and it just meant a lot to me. I got really emotional and started crying a little bit when I read it the other day. That's just me though. I just am crying about Tolkien all the time. This line also, it reminds me of when the moon first arose in the night sky and how Melkor was just confounded by it and horrified by its unanticipated light and power. The power of these lights surprises and intimidates Shelob, allowing Frodo and Sam to run towards the tunnel's end. There they are met with a thick, densely woven web blocking their passage. Now Sam's sword is unable to break the web, but Frodo is able to quickly slash through it with the use of Sting. The power of the elves holds authority over the darkness, and we can see that again in this chapter, casting fear into Shelob and giving them the chance to escape the tunnel. And when they're tangled by her webs, Sting is able to slice through them pretty easily. There's a power that comes from the goodness of the elves, and this power is stronger than evil, even in this very dark and hopeless place, we can be reminded of that. This chapter also reminds me of a verse from the first chapter of the gospel according to John. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Shelob is really the embodiment of evil in so many ways. She's consumed with a hatred of all living things and this insatiable lust to consume everything. She's the daughter of Ungoliant. The strength of her evil is illustrated in part by her suffocating darkness. And yet, by the grace of the elven lights, Frodo and Sam are able to stand against it. At last, they're free of the tunnel, and Frodo runs desperately and, unfortunately, heedlessly. Having left Sam with the file, Shelob swiftly pursues Frodo as he's running. Before Sam can warn him that Shelob is coming, he is attacked by Gollum, who has returned and um, is really thinking that his plans are all coming together and that he's about to win. So, Sam and Gollum are fighting, and then eventually Gollum flees back into the tunnel 
and Sam runs to Frodo. However, he is unfortunately too late, and Frodo has been overtaken by Shelob. Chapter 10. The Choices of Master Samwise Sam is horrified to find Shelob bent over Frodo, and he charges towards her desperately. He fights with a fury Tolkien describes as greater than any she had known in countless years, until she eventually impales herself upon Sam as he's holding Sting. She springs away from him, quivering in pain, and Sam draws out the file of Galadriel. At his invocation of Elbereth, the file blazes like a white torch, burning Shelob's eyes and sending her back into her tunnel in defeat. Sam then turns to Frodo, who is laying pale and unmoving on the ground. Shelob had stung him, and Sam believes now that he is dead. He falls into utter despair, unsure of how to carry on or what to do without Frodo, because in his mind, his fate was so tied to Frodo that the possibility of going on or having to do anything without Frodo is is shocking to him, and and he's totally shaken, and he doesn't know what to do. He struggles um, to discern how to go on, but at last he resolves that he is going to have to carry Frodo's burden for him, and he's going to finish the quest, and then he's going to, hopefully... Um, His last wish is that he'll be able to return to Frodo's body. A company of orcs sees Frodo lying around and brings, and they pick him up and carry him with him, and they pick him up and carry him along with them into the tunnels towards the tower. Sam puts on the ring and he pursues them, so they can't see him, but he's eavesdropping um, and hearing about their plans and news of the enemy, and he learns a whole lot about what's going on through this conversation. As they pass away from Sam, they mention, oh, actually, you know, this guy's not dead. He's only stunned. And as the book comes to a close, the orcs pass through a great door, leaving Sam behind and hopeless. Tolkien writes, Frodo was alive, but taken by the enemy. What a way to end a book. It's rough. That's a rough, that's a rough way to end the story, isn't it? Can you imagine finishing The Two Towers when it was published in November of 1954 and having to wait until The Return of the King was published in October of 1955 to see what happens to Frodo? Um, You would have to spend an entire year with Frodo was alive but taken by the enemy and not knowing. Can you imagine? Like, we are so privileged to live in this time when we can finish The Two Towers and immediately pick up The Return of the King. Luckily, we won't have to wait 11 months to find out what happens to Frodo because we are going to be reading and discussing book five, the first half of The Return of the King, on January 1st. Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I would love to hear from you. You can reach me on Twitter or Instagram at Tea with Tolkien or by using the contact form on my website, teawithtolkien.com. Also, would like to thank our generous patrons for helping support this podcast, for helping cover the cost of the website fees and all of like podcast equipment and hosting fees. You guys are wonderful and I sincerely appreciate you. You're the absolute best. If you would like to learn about our Patreon community, you can go to patreon.com slash tea with Tolkien. And I hope you all have a wonderful advent. Um, just a reminder, I have a couple new designs of free printable art on our website. So you can check those out if you're interested in adding some pieces of Tolkien-inspired art to your home. I've also got some free hand-drawn printable gift tags if you'd like to make your Christmas gifts look a little bit more hobbity. I think they're very cute, and I think you'll like them. You can find it all at teawithtolkien.com. Until next time, I hope you have a wonderful month, and I will see you in the Discord. (laughs) 